Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this last uh, talk in the framework of the Vienna Humanities Festival 2022. Our guest tonight has been called the Sherlock Holmes of our times by some. It has been called by the spokesman of the um, Foreign Ministry of Russia, Graza Sivotainova, which means a threat to every secret. Some others call him the pop star of investigative journalism. Welcome to Christo Grozev, who is the lead investigator from Bellingcat uh, for Russia. Uh, since 2015, you're doing that, and you are dealing that with security threats, extraterritorial clandestine operations, and the weaponization of uh, information. Um, a lot of your work is very widely known. Uh, it is enough probably to mention here the MH17 case, the Kremlin's attempt to influence politics in the Balkans, uh, in the case of 2014, the Republika Srpska elections, two years later in Montenegro, the failed coup attempt. Then you were key in uh, actually revealing the identities of those who tried to, who, to uh, poison the Skripals with the Novichok. Um, then, I guess many of you have seen the film about Navalny. Um, you have revealed um, the FSB uh, officers that have poisoned him. The list is really, really long, and it includes even in your native Bulgaria the, the attempt to um, kill and poison uh, uh, weapons um, um, producer, yeah. manufacturer. Um, Crystal and his team and Bellingcat uh, have uh, numerous uh, prizes. Your Skripal investigation brought you the European Prize for Journalism. The list is really, really long, the list of uh, awards that you have received. The last one I came across came only this week, I think. It yeah. was an investigative films festival somewhere in Italy, if I'm not mistaken. Welcome, Christo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Your professional life has been linked to journalism since you were 17. You started as a journalist back in Bulgaria. Um, then you moved on to media production. You have founded um, different radio stations across Europe, in Bulgaria, in Ukraine, in Holland, in Estonia. And then in 2015, just one year after Bellingcat was founded by Elliot Higgins, uh, you joined them. Can you tell us a little bit of how you made this move and why? Well, first, uh, I wouldn't separate my life into journalism and then only business in media and then journalism because whenever I was still, when I was still doing just commercial radio, I was still also dabbling at uh, investigative journalism. Um, and, and, and that taught me the basics of open source investigations, which were kind of new in the uh, late 2000s, and also taught me that you can use the power of investigative journalism to force governments and uh, transnational uh, or, or um, supranational organizations to act, uh, even if they don't want to act. So one of the investigations I did uh, with some colleagues uh, from Bulgaria in 2009 was the investigation into the monopolization of s essentially state cash assets by one particular bank in Bulgaria. Then we did a sort of a filing, very detailed filing to the European Commission based on that investigation and we were three years we were trying to force the European Commission to take action on that and ultimately what, what, what I learned from that is you can when you present facts that are well laid out and difficult to ignore then you can make even lazy organizations like the European Commission to act and you can do the same with prosecution um, so this was I think one of the things that led me to want to join Bellingcat in 2014 because I realized, okay, if you can outsource the open source gathering of data and laying it out in a very structured way, convincing way, in a transparent way, we can maybe do more around the world to force lazy governments to act. So in 2014, the first thing that Bellingcat started working on was the investigation into MH17, which was the downing of the Malaysian airliner uh, on the 17th of July, 2014. And it was, this was a couple of months after I had started blogging on my own blog. 
um, because I didn't need to spend so much time with my business. And my focus was the war in Ukraine, which started back then, by the way, and uh, not this year. And I, I was focusing more, mostly on what I knew best, which was disinformation and how to identify narratives and false narratives. Um, so I started focusing on how the Russian government started disinforming the world about the MH17 thing. So my first contribution to Bellingcat was on the topic of disinformation. And only the next year, the following year, I decided that actually there's more to be done than just disinformation and debunking false narratives. And, uh, and then we started working on identifying the people behind the downing of MH17. And, uh, and that was a big success, to which I take only a small credit because the whole team of Bellingcat, about, at that time, about 15 volunteers with a diverse background from engineers and uh, computer nerds and uh, uh, historians, they all were spending three or four hours a day trying to piece things together from open source, uh, from social media, which resulted in being able to trace the origin of the weapon back to Russia. Uh, and, and the movement on a minute by minute basis was done by this crowdsourced uh, group. And my, my role there was relatively small in trying to identify the people that were captured on several phones and in, uh, as giving the order for the shutdown. The model of Bellingcat was working with volunteers a lot, as you mentioned, so it was crowdsourced uh, research that they're into. Uh, and my question is, how do you do that? I mean, and isn't there a threat that actually you got, get infiltrated, that someone who actually wants to do, want to mislead you, uh, gets into your team? How do you overcome this threat? No, there is this threat, and it's become more expressed recently. Uh, since Bellingcat has become more of a household name um, and much more of a threat to the to different governments, including the Russian government. In the early years, um, we were welcoming any volunteer and we would give them direct access to our working uh, Slack chat groups. Um, and we would restrict only some of the most, most confidential investigations to people that are proven to be long-term Bellingcat volunteers. Mm. And especially since the Navalny investigation, which kind of put us on the top of the enemy list in the, of the Kremlin, we've seen an influx of volunteers. 99% of them are, I'm sure, real and authentic, but even if 1% one, 1 are what we have found in a few cases to be planted volunteers, then, then that's a risk. So we've kind of become less open to accept new volunteers. And this is, I know it's very insulting to really, really good intentioned young people who want to join us, but we have to take it slowly. So we're, we're, we're taking, I mean, we've made mistakes in the past by allowing too much. Uh, uh, I've given this example once and I'll, I'll repeat it here, although my colleagues are very angry. In 2017, we were training uh, people, uh, we, we, we keep training, that's one of the things we do, we train other journalists in the tr open source investigation methods. And one of the groups that we trained in 2017 had one member who later turned out to be a GRU spy. So we trained the GRU spy. Mm. So we have to be careful. Yeah. 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 Tell me, how do you select the cases that you get involved in? Um, and what uh, do you think of the accusations that you're kind of activist uh, media? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I don't know what kind of media we are. We are kind of sui generis, um, and it's developed over the years, so it's not like we started with a particular strategy. Um, we don't have an editor-in-chief. We don't have any editorial hierarchy. You're we, now executive director and director? That means nothing. That okay. I still have to fight for any of my research pieces to be published, and the fighting goes with two or three, um, uh, we're now recruiting more, gatekeeper editors. And these are essentially editors who are, they serve as lawyers for the subjects that we're investigating. So it's more of we are fighting through the legal team of the subjects of our investigation who are trying to come up with an innocent hypothesis all the time. And that's the only editorial role we have. Well, they also have a fact-checking function, but really they try to push back on our, on our publications until they're convinced that their last argument is gone, that we, we, we have a case, we've proven the case. But there's no editorial supervision saying, oh, 
for this week we need three articles and who's going to do this, you do this. Each of the researchers and some volunteers is free to choose a topic that they feel competent in or passionate about. And of course, this can lead to a bias in self-selection of topics, no question about it. Um, we're trying to fix that by focusing on regions that we haven't covered before or potential crimes that we haven't covered before, but there will always be this bias what, of self-selection of topics. What cannot be, and what we, are, we have a really, really firm structure about, is that on any topic you start investigating, if it turns out that the findings don't serve your expectations, you still publish, and you do it thoroughly. And this has resulted in articles that started with maybe the expectation of some researchers that that attack on an Afghanistan hospital was not a NATO bomb, but it turned out it was a NATO bomb, and we published a very thorough investigation on the NATO bomb that hit the hospital. And similarly, on the American sale of uh, missiles to Saudi Arabia that were used in Yemen and killed a lot of innocent people, and so on and so forth. So there could be a bias in the selection, but never a bias in the process of investigation. Mm -hmm. Tell me, how do you find your data? Is the data just um, lying around and waiting for people with enough knowledge to find it and to collect it and to analyze it? Or do you have to buy it? from? Well, let's say that there's more data lying out there waiting to be found than people wanting to find it. So yes, um, there are hundreds or thousands of available, already leaked databases but it takes time to understand them, to, to download them from torrent sites, and to put them together into something meaningful. Um, but so what we do is we use open source as a first uh, line of attack, uh, social media postings, uh, Twitter accounts, and so on and so forth. Um, government databases that are available on the internet for, uh, for free. Second line of attack is search downloaded, but already the available, available leaked database, which can include um, the sort of passport numbers and names of a small village in Siberia, or um, driver's licenses numbers and photographs from Moscow, and so on and so forth, but things that are already leaked on the internet, and we've downloaded them. And the third and last line of attack, but only when, based on the first two, we have a very convincing hypothesis that there's a crime and that we know who has committed, but we need to prove it for the audiences, then we allow ourselves to buy data. And we buy data from the Russian or Belarusian or Ukrainian um, gray markets of data. These are markets that have existed long before journalists started using them. They were previously used by criminals. And we kind of innovated it that journalists started using the same market, which, is, uh, which kind of caused confusion in the market because they were used to selling to criminals and never to journalists. And they got away with that because, the, uh, for example, the FSB, who are kind of making, taking a cut out of their market, they didn't mind that there were these data brokers selling to criminals. But they clearly they mind when journalists are buying them. Mm -hmm. And is it legal to buy this data? In that way? Interestingly, there was a, this was a legal question that was discussed in a court case uh, last year in Germany. That was the investigation into the killing of a um, Chechen slash Georgian asylum seeker, uh, Hango um by an FSB officer. And we were able to prove that it was an FSB hit job. We proved who the killer was. And there was based on a combination of open source data and bought data from the Russian market. And the judge actually took a whole day to investigate the legality of us buying data, which is technically illegal under Russian law. And the judge concluded that um, the public interest in this case clearly outweighs the, the infraction, the administrative infraction of Russian law. Uh, but of course, this doesn't mean you can do it in a probative way, that you can do it trying to guess if there's a crime. You can't do phishing for data, uh, for a crime in data. You have to know that there's a crime, and then you have to know what data you need, and you have to put very, very strict restrictions on how you can use that data and never go beyond the minimum that you need. So never go to relatives, never, uh, never publish anything that would allow other journalists who may be less ethical to 
extract personal data and publish about relatives. So it's a very, very complex um, self-restrictive process. What makes you different than WikiLeaks in this respect? I think we have nothing in common. WikiLeaks leak data. Let's even assume for a minute that they're not biased in what they decide, decide to leak. Uh, let's, let's assume, uh, very hypothetically, they leak everything that they get. Uh, but they leak it together with personal data with no value added, really, uh, which is the exact opposite of what we would ever do. We would only publish um, the findings of a crime. And even when we know for sure ourselves who the criminal is, we put a restriction to not even publish sometimes their name because we want to protect innocent bystanders, relatives, and so on and so forth. Interesting case from a couple of weeks ago. We investigated the uh, mutilation and execution of a Ukrainian prisoner of war by what appeared to be a, a Russian uh, officer or Russian soldier that was caught on a video, and it was published on Russian pro-war channels as a sort of a uh, motivating video. And uh, we identified the person who did the mutilation and the ex execution, and we chose not to publish his name. We published the story, we published uh, basically the unit from which he was, but we didn't publish his name because we were afraid of vigilant justice, uh, vigilante justice going against his family and so on and so forth. Uh, so, of course, there was a bit of a uh, de 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 debate and dispute within Bellingcat. Is this the right way to do it? Because we know that others will publish the name sooner or later. Um, but the editors, the draconian editors, decided, no, we're not publishing the name. And interestingly, yesterday, no, on Friday, uh, America, the American Treasury published his name based on our investigations on a sanctions list. So sooner or later, somebody publishes his name, even if you try to protect the bystanders. Mm. How much overlap there is uh, between the work you do and the work of intelligence officers? Well, overlap in terms that we are... Uh, I, sometimes I feel they should be doing the work we're doing, uh, and, and I hope they do, but their, their work is, in 99% of the cases, invisible. So they don't publish their findings. They sometimes advise their governments, other times not even that. So that's the difference. We, we only work on things we will publish. Mm -hmm. um, if there's no chance to publish it, well, uh, we, 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 we're not allowed to spend even an hour on something we don't plan to publish. So I think that's the difference. And as a consequence of that difference, our work becomes more and more difficult with each new publication because we disclose transparently the method, methods that we use to arrive at a finding. And this allows the bad actors to close loopholes. Whereas intelligence services, they don't disclose what they know, and therefore they can continue finding more data uh, through loopholes for long, longer. Do they contact you for help sometimes? Yes, and we have made a very uh, explicit decision to not help them, but we don't mind helping law enforcement, police and prosecutions um, with our findings. How often does it happen? Is it nowadays already regular that you have, you're ca helping the justice system? Um, I think uh, all the time. Uh, we are helping several European prosecutorial authorities on a long string of malign operations by Russia from 2008, lasting until last year, which resulted in targeted bombings and explosions across Europe of munition um, storage facilities. So, in fact, it seems that Russia attacked NATO territory back in 2009 and continued until now, but only now we're still wondering whether they will attack NATO. But on that, for example, there are so many countries in Europe that are working on that, that many prosecutions are coming to us as kind of unifying uh, know-it-all guy, uh, So because we, we, we've, we see the bigger picture and they tend to see only the respective ter uh, sovereign part of their, uh, their part of the crime. Mm -hmm. But who do you see as your main client, so to say? Um, is it the general public? Is it uh, law enforcement? No, 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 our main client. Well, we have two parts of Bellingcat, or two vectors. One is the journalism vector, and the other one is justice and accountability. And usually they work together. But during this war, for example, we've decided to m create a Chinese wall between the two. The, the JNA, the Jur Justice and Accountability Group, which is 15 people now, we split the 30 people of Bellingcat in half. 
they only work on data gathering for law enforcement. Data gathering of war crimes, potential war crimes, civilian harm, and they're creating this database that will be very easy to be used by courts, which means following the chain of command, the chain of uh, custody of every piece of information, archiving it, copying it, making sure it's not deleted, uh, geolocating it, chronolocating it, delivering it then to law enforcement, saying, here, we've done the job for you, don't be lazy, right? And these guys have no right to write articles because we don't want them to be biased in, uh, in what they gather. They have to gather everything. And a completely separate 15, uh, 15 members of the team work on specific stories that have to be written in real time because delaying justice is going to, uh, to, to be denying justice. So for example, now we are about to publish, I think tomorrow, an investigation into the shelling uh, two days ago, which happened in uh, uh, Zaporizhia, which resulted in uh, at least 100 wounded and, and 25 or more dead. And it was a typical case of he, sh he said, she had. Russia says Ukraine bombed and killed its own people, and Ukraine said the opposite. So we, we think that something like this, which has so many casualties and which has um, two different sides of the story that nobody seems to know how to resolve, uh, we have to publish in real time. So this is for the regular reader, whereas the justice and accountability is for law enforcement. What are you doing in Ukraine now during the war, uh, collecting evidence for uh, war atrocities? This is the main, uh, main thing we're doing. Um, currently, we've collected evidence of about, we call them civilian harm incidents. We don't call them war crimes because we're not the prosecutor, we're not uh, the, the judge. So they're potential war crimes. Uh, out of about 1,600 such cases, it seems that at least 20% appear to be instances of war crimes, appear to be. And each of these cases is not one person uh, killed or, or, killed or, or uh, wounded. It's one incident, which may be, for example, that what happened two days ago is one incident. So the cumulative number of wounded and killed people unfortunately is more than 20,000 uh, of, of what we're looking at. Uh, but this is the main, main job. Um, and and then, how do you envisage this data to be used? Uh, we already have um, protocols of intent from several prosecutorial um, agencies around the world. Uh, fortunately, they've asked us not to disclose who they are, but I can say that 11 prosecutions around the world have opened investigations into war crimes in Ukraine. Um, including transnational bodies and, and courts, and we uh, and all, most of them have expressed interest in using this data. Mm -hmm. Do you have uh, insight into Kremlin's war machine mind, so to say, um, something that you can insight you can give us about, uh, especially after the mobilization, what is going in Kremlin in Kremlin's war machine in the security services? I, I absolutely hate the word insights when we're talking insights and insights when we're talking about the Kremlin because it seems to be a smoke and mirrors organization where nobody even close to Putin knows what he's thinking or what he will think tomorrow. So any insight is, is a waste of time. But analytically what can be seen is that um, there is a complete loss of control of the narrative, in, especially after the mobilization. Um, we see that um, the discontent against Putin's handling of the war, not necessarily against the war, is already coming from three vectors. And before that, it was only one vector, the sort of, let's call it conventionally, the, uh, the liberal vector or the opposition-minded vector. But now we have the, uh, the ultra-nationalist vector who are extremely unhappy with, with Putin's management of the war. I mean, of course, when they talk about Putin's mismanagement of the war, most of them use a euphemism. So they talk about the bad generals, but like we're talking about the bad generals um, in Moscow, on Frunziska, Naberezhne, but we really mean Putin. So that's a huge discontent at the moment. So huge that actually they've started coming up with alternative figureheads that they're praising all the time, almost as if they're messaging Putin, if you don't fall in line and become much more cruel than you are if you don't use nuclear, if you don't attack the centers of uh, decision-making in Kremlin, in, in, in Kiev, we will replace you with 
Kadyrov and Prigozhin. So anyway, this new vector is putting a lot of pressure on him. And then there's the, for now, latent, uh, but very soon kinetic vector of the mother's husbands, mother's daughters, uh, wives of the newly mobilized uh, hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers who will start coming back in body bags in the next couple of months. So that is the one that I think may be a trigger of some major change. Not because they will be so powerful, but because they will be a perfect instrument for the, let's say, the elite that doesn't want this war to continue. Mm -hmm. I think there will be many questions, so I want to leave enough time for them. But one last question from me. Do you know anything about the Nord Stream leakages? Something that you can share with us? We're, we're investigating that. I, I think uh, the one thing I can comment, and I, I don't, I, until we finish an investigation, I, I don't comment on the findings, but I want to express the surprise that uh, there was so much expert analysis that accused Russia of doing this without any piece of evidence, just based on the uh, non-Oxcom non razor compatible argument that if Russia does it uh, to itself, then it can also win. Not only others can win. So it's a bit of a stretch. And yes, that's a possibility, but jumping so quickly on that and picking it as the main one was uh, a bit strange to me. Okay, thank you. Now it's time for questions. So please um, show me with your hands if you have a, a question and the microphone will come to you. I see one hand there already. Hi. My name is Anna Ruppesheimer. Um, it's a pleasure to see you in person. Thank you for all you do. There's um, just on the last point that you were discussing, um, splitting your team into an investigatory unit and a journalism unit. On the investigatory side in Ukraine, there seem to be a lot of efforts that are existing um, on the top uh, transnational level, the ICC, to national um, authorities, to coordinating mechanisms because there are so many investigatory efforts. So there is a US-EU um, joint um, group that exists that's trying to coordinate the various um, players, including NGOs that um, are comprised of um, prior government investigators. So lots of people with lots of expertise are in that space. Why did you think um, it's worth it for you to make a difference there? Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, very good question. Uh, we've discussed this a lot. And the reason why we decided to uh, focus on this during the war, because we could have done other things, like counting number of casualties and validating the number of destroyed weapons. But we thought what we noticed is a lot of NGOs doing exactly this work, um, collecting open source evidence, um, but doing it in a way that is very um, comprehensive in terms of volume of pieces of data that they're gathering, maybe having access to uh, to even data that uh, we don't have, but collecting it in a way that is not court compliant. And uh, we, through prior mistakes, we know what court admissible evidence from open source sources is, because we did, um, we did a lot of uh, data gathering in the Syrian war that was turned out to not be court compatible, court uh, admissible. And we learned from those mistakes, and in 2018 or 19, we uh, tested the method of data gathering according to the Berkeley Protocol and other uh, others. Uh, tested it in an actual court case in the UK. And it was a mock court trial um, using uh, essentially data gathered in the Yemen conflict only from open sources and presenting our data to a court, a real British court or UK court. And then we had people on the other side saying, no, this is invalid. And we, we won, but we were given very clear reasons why we won. And we're following exactly this, and we're, we're trying to explain this to other, others who are doing the, the same work, and we're trying to unite them into one uh, platform. So it's not because we want to have more data than them, but we, because we've, we've gone through this problem uh, before. Um, 
and with interna uh, international and, and cross-national organizations, well, we're just there to help them because they cannot, they have a focus on gathering data on the field, in the field, on the ground. They go in, and talk to witnesses um, and, and take uh, witness statements. They don't have the time to actually do comprehensive funnel gathering of data from open sources. Um, so that's why we, we feel that there's a need for that, and we know because they've told us that they want our data. Mm -hmm. There's a question there and there in the back after that. What type of open data are you using for the case of Ukraine? Um, well, Ukraine, the Ukraine war provides more open source data than any conflict in the past, uh, but that is the obvious sources. TikTok, Twitter, uh, Telegram, and so on and so forth. Um, the volume of imagery and videos generated on a daily basis is unprecedented. So in fact, our goal is we have a scraping mechanism that gets all of this data. But what the value added is first to make sure that something is not post-dated, something is not recycled from a previous conflict or from a previous phase of this conflict then to geolocate it, uh, make sure that it happened at the place where it says it happened, chronolocate it, uh, which is part of also uh, the, the first stage. Um, but then also we have to remove the, the ones that appear to be staged or appear to be, uh, to be um, sourced from one source only. So we have to find context that explains what happened on this video. And we're putting all of this in, into a very comprehensive database with a, with a context, with a source, one, two, three, four, usually there's 16 or 18 sources for each uh, video or photographic evidence. Um, and uh, we classify it with number of casualties, number of wounded, and so on and so forth. But it's, 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 no, it's, no, it's no rocket science. It's, it's literally the things that you as a user would be able to find, but, but you would find probably a small selection of it. And this is something that uh, I've, I've said recently. The volume of visual data from this conflict is so overwhelming that it allows propaganda machines uh, on, on any side, but, but let's take Russia as an example, to produce to completely false narratives based on 100% real data. So they take a small subsection of the video or the open source data that is really available. They don't forge it, but they just take the 0.1% that fits their narrative. And that is enough to fill a one-hour TV uh, program on, on Channel 1 on Russian television. So it's the first time that I see where fake narratives in propaganda are created 100% based on, on, on real stories. Mm. <clears throat> Question there. Hi. You've mentioned balancing a lot of things like uh, expedition of uh, inquiry and uh, possible damages of uh, publication. What about protecting sources? So there are some things that are open source, but some things are like the information markets may be more sensitive. And do you have any thought about you know, keeping uh, channels of communication that they use open and unencrypted so that the, you can maybe in the future receive more information rather than publish something now? Mm. Um, this is really the... The first part of the question is the thing that has kept me and many of my colleagues sleepless for, uh, for many nights. Um, first, because the way the machine, the government machine, started reacting to our investigations in the beginning was with annoyance, with nuisance. Um, then they started trying to close the loopholes, um, for example, making unavailable in government run databases uh, data about spies. But then that became a problem for them because we started looking for disappearing data and that allowed us to find even more spies. Um, and then after the Navalny investigation, they just went all repressive and they started arresting, torturing sources, uh, well, uh, data sources. And we had to ex extract some of them from Russia and uh, place them in other countries. That comes with a cost and the cost is not just financial, but you have to like, adopt whole families forever, it seems, or until something changes in Russia. And more recently, we've 
reconsidered the use of such data and we've put a much higher threshold of when we can afford ourselves private data from the Russian market or the Belarusian market. And the balance is clearly, when, when, you, when you're looking at a life and death situation where uh, publishing something will reduce the likelihood of future uh, clandestine lethal activity, then, then it's worth taking the risk. Otherwise, if it's just for proving a spy existed, uh, we don't do that. So that is a really hard uh, dilemma. The second one, second question is a good example of how long we're willing to stretch not publishing something in order to get more data is the investigation into, that we published about uh, three weeks ago into a Russian female spy who was able to infiltrate NATO uh, and clearly get a lot of, do a lot of damage to NATO. Um, we investigated her for a year. We knew enough to publish a story within a month. So basically by December of 2021, we had enough to publish on her. But we didn't because she was already in Russia. She couldn't do more damage. But what we found out about her case allowed us to look around and find others that fit the profile. So. The, when there's no urgency, then we can wait a long time before we disclose our methods. Mm -hmm. Please raise your hand when you have questions. No questions, okay. Then I will ask one. Um, oh, there's one, but be before the microphone goes there, um, do you think that Bellingcat has changed or is changing uh, the way investigative journalism is being done? Are traditional media following you going yeah, 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 into yeah, open source? But, but, it's, but there are two ways in which it's following. Uh, one is following not us, but the open source community, uh, where we were just one of the kind of names in it. But it, it was a natural occurrence because the open source community was the one that discovered that secrets can be hidden in plain sight. And before that, traditional media were like, oh, no, no. If it's a real secret, it will be held tightly by a source. So we have to develop a source. So the open source mania in media developed in 2015. And uh, some traditional media poached, uh, for example, open source investigators from, from Bellingcat, from others, one of our founding volunteers, uh, Christian, um, he, uh, he, was, he became the head of visual media for New York Times. Um, so and it, it became a trend. So in the like 15 to 20, a lot of media created their own OSINT uh, units. The Spiegel has it and, and so on and so forth. So um, yes, that changed, but I think maybe we contributed a little bit to that because we, we had a few successful stories with OSINT. Um, I, I think we're contributing some change in the in, in a different area where we've shown that um, you can create a competence in a particular area that even government law enforcement agencies don't, and you can push them to, to take action based on your findings. This existed before as well, but uh, but the understanding that journalism can actually be better at finding the truth than police and, law and intelligence agencies, I think we've changed a little bit the mindset on that. And a lot of colleagues have, have become more, uh, more um, uh, willing to invest time in, in such investigations that look hopeless. For example, cold cases, something that has been dropped by police. Um, a lot of media are now re reopening court. And, and the last thing I would say that I think we contributed in is crowdsourcing and collaborative work. We don't look for scoops. We don't care if we're the, the media that owns the scoop. We invite as many other media to participate in the investigation. And we, we allow the audience or the readers to participate in it. Uh, the perfect example for this was after the Navalny investigation, where we proved that there's a unit of about 15 people, at least 15 people, working for the FSB, whose goal is to poison opposition figures. Um, we found that with our own resources, we can only explain about 5% of their travels. Um, and we thought, okay, but, but they travel so frequently in groups of three or four to different places around Russia. And we don't know what happened 
on the 17th of February 2012 in uh, Ekaterinburg. But we thought maybe the people who live there know what happened. So we just published the whole travel data for all 15 people. Later we added more, so it's like for 23 people that work for this secret unit. We published their travel data in an easy-to-use Excel sheet with um, dates and places, and we asked the readers, just jump in. Tell us what, in comments, tell us, tell us what may have happened in your place. And we've, we received more than a thousand tips, and of course most of them are... Uh, the, 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 one thing, the one tip that we got more than everything else is there was the, the death of a very popular Russian rap singer, rapper. So it seems that everybody wants him to have been killed by the FSB. <laughs> Maybe, but we didn't find the evidence for that. But we did receive eight extremely valuable tips which allowed us to connect this unit to the attempted poison, to the poisonings and att attempted killings of uh, the Russian poet uh, Dmitry Bukov. We would not have found it without the crowdsourced component. Uh, three local activists in the Caucasus. We didn't know the names of these people, so there was no way for us to even find that, that something strange happened to them. Um, they were like human rights leaders in uh, Balkyria and in Dagestan and uh, in Chechnya. And, um, and then a couple of other, and, and including one who was in fact um, somebody who worked for the Kremlin and then apparently they tre treated him as a traitor, so they killed him as well. So I think it's this collaborative work that has become also a fashion and we are, mm -hmm. we're happy with that. And you often work in consortia with traditional media like Spiegel you mentioned and others. Is it because of the local knowledge they have or is it because you want to involve them in your investigations in order to influence the way they work and the cases they engage with? Well, it's, it's both. Um, in some cases, we think that our findings are so crazy looking and sounding that it's better if people find that other media have also looked at them and, and, and vouch with their name that this is not like invented data. Uh, with the Navalny investigation, it did, it did uh, look like such a shocking finding that we wanted other media to also join in. But we also like to, uh, to use the local knowledge. For example, uh, we have a, a very good friend here from TAM Media in, in Switzerland. So everything that has a focus on Switzerland, uh, we invite them because we know that they will get, uh, similar to the guy from Ekaterinburg telling us what happened on that day, uh, the guy from Switzerland will be much better than we to find out the significance of a particular date or time or, or place. Mm -hmm. The question there in the back. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much. And um, I do appreciate you collecting the evidences on Ukraine. And um, we often hear the like analogs when we're talking about the tribunal, like the possible tribunal for the Russian oppressors. And the people who mentioned Yugoslavia and the dozens of years, like decades that took for the people to be sentenced for whatever they did before. Uh, when talking about Ukraine, do you have any prediction or the time frame or whatever? And what kind of courts these might be that you will deal with so that those that will be able to provide whatever responsibility for those people who really are guilty so that it wouldn't be this, we re, like we request the extradition of someone and blah, 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 and it will last for, I don't know, for forever. Is there any way to... For, like, for this uh, justice to be executed. Thank you. Well, I mean, there are ongoing international fora of uh, uh, Russian government-sponsored uh, killers that, uh, that show the, the limits of what you can do in the current scenario with the current regime in place. You have uh, the five people who are indicted and, uh, in, the, in the downing of MH17. Four of them are Russian citizens. One is a Ukrainian citizen hiding in Russia. And the verdict will come out um, on the 17th of November in the Netherlands based on a joint investigation by a joint uh, five-country team. So it's the closest to a tribunal that you can have in that case. But then whether, whether these people will face real justice depends on... Uh, on on, on, on the major change in not only in government but governance in Russia, because the current constitution prevents Russia from uh, extraditing anybody. Um, however, the current constitution in Russia does not prevent the Russian 
a government, if it's based on rule of law, of enforcing a foreign uh, verdict in, in Russia. Um, so it really depends on, on changes in Russia. So that leads to the question whether, uh, so before I answer that, the ICC at the minimum, at the moment, is conducting a very thorough investigation, not only in war crimes in Ukraine at the moment, the good news is that they've now taken this hint um, of the war in Ukraine and the clear war crimes conducted by the Russian government there to also investigate some previous crimes conducted by Russia on Ukrainian territory in 2014, 15, and 16, including, for example, the, um, the uh, creation of concentration camps. There's the isolation concentration camp in Donetsk that was nobody had a hope that it will be investigated by an international body. Now there is a hope that it will be in in investigated by the ICC. But even more so, there is now a hope that the ICC might look at some crime against humanity that took place in Russia, because otherwise that will remain completely uh, unaccounted for. For example, the poisoning of all these people by the FSB. Um, so, but it all depends on, real justice depends on change of uh, government and governance in Russia. I don't see this model, the, the Kremlin regime surviving long term. What is long term? Two years or more. Uh, why? Because I don't see stability. I mean, uh, the reason why the Russian government was able to maintain uh, relative control over its population for the last 15, 20 years was because of a intentional or unintentional social contract that uh, they offered to the population, which was uh, you will get stability, including economic stability, but in return don't meddle in politics. We'll do it for you, we'll do the elections, everything will be fine. And freedom of speech uh, was allowed for many years in a bubbly homeopathic uh, dosage so that people don't complain that they don't have freedom of speech. They, they could um, talk to their friends about what they think. They could listen to radio, uh, Mo um, Echo of Moscow. They could watch TV, Dost, and so on and so forth. Now, this model completely changed um, starting a year ago, and it, the new equilibrium has never been tested. Uh, the new equilibrium means no bubbles, so essentially Russians had to leave if they couldn't support a completely draconian, repressive uh, information environment, and they do, did leave. I mean. We, we see uh, tens of thousands and now hundreds of thousands um, because of the mobilization, young Russians leaving. And second, uh, we see that uh, the most important part, which is the stability, economic stability, is now not in sight anymore. But crucially, and in the shortest term, um, because of the war, in the initial phase of the war, the large part of the Russian passive population was accepting the war completely because they were seeing it as a football soccer championship on television. It was a war that they participated as an observer on television in the evening and they were shouting for their team. And suddenly that changed a week ago. And this whole model, th these are changes that have never been tested by Putin or anyone before in Russia. So that's why I think it leads to a total instability. It's a breakage of the social contract. And um, it will result in discontent, in random decisions by him because he's trying to be reactive. For example, accepting the mobilization despite the fact that he knew they would cause a social implosion because he was under threat from the right-wing uh, nationalists. So now what we're having is three, three parts of society that cannot stand Putin. We have the extreme nationalists who think he's way too soft and that he gave up uh, territories already that were taken um, and he was too late with the mobilization. We have the so-called liberal um, opposition-minded younger people who already hated him before and, and now even more. And then we have the radicalized um, young people who didn't hate him before because they thought they were watching a football championship, but now they realize they have to play. And then you have the mothers and the, and the sisters and the, and the wives, who will be extremely unhappy in a couple of months when body bags start coming. And I don't really understand what his social base will be after that. It will be essentially everybody hating him. Uh, so I cannot, I cannot see this model lasting. And without predicting specifically what will happen, I'm afraid that we also have 
the possibility for a right-wing coup taking place in Russia before, uh, before actually transitioning to, uh, to uh, normal democracy. Uh, if, if what happened in Russia in 1993, which was the last time there was a conservative right-wing coup that happened there, it should be a short-term uh, short one, I hope. So let me repeat this. You just said that you give Putin's regime about two years more, right? <laughs> this was a very light, very hopeful statement. Uh, at least this is how I took it. But yeah. what is the chance that yeah, and during I'll this... I'll switch off the phone in two years so I can't be held responsible yeah. for this. <laughs> but what is the chance that during these two years um, the red button is being pushed? Something that we are all now afraid of. Um, I, I have only one way to answer this, which is that the likelihood of Putin using this bluff is, uh, like acting on the bluff, is, is relatively low for two reasons. First of all, because it only works before he pushes it, so it only works as a bluff. Uh, after that, there's no winning strategy for him because the expectation that that will put an end to the war the only time that the nuclear weapon has been used successfully is after the end of a war, right? So if to use it before that, knowing, being told explicitly that that will result in an uh, escalation and involvement of NATO into the war, um, whether or not with nuclear counterattack, uh, which is unlikely, uh, means the end of his regime. So I, I think the bluff is not going to be used by him. And the second reason is that he can only do this, or he can only give the order, because he doesn't physically have a button to push, yeah? He has to give the order. And I've checked over and over again how many people must follow his order before somebody presses the actual button. And it's between four and, and six people, depending on the type of tactical or, or non-tactical. Um, so for him to give the instruction, he must be sure that all four or six will follow the instruction. Because the first time one of them does not follow the instruction, that's the end of him as a free man or as a live man, right? Um, and we, we don't have to debate this because this is what every Russian FSB or, or GRU or military officer will tell you. Oh yeah, if somebody doesn't follow Putin's order now during time of war, he'll be arrested within an hour. So that's, that's consensus. So the question is, will he give an order? When will he give such an order? I think it almost, the answer is like in the first case, only when he's winning. Because when he's not winning, the risk of somebody saying, why would I support somebody who may not be here in a month to protect me, is very high. And knowing that, he will not give that order. Wow, thank you very much <laughs> for this help. There's a question in the back there. Thank you very much. I've been hesitating to ask this question. Um, so if you don't uh, want to answer, um, I'll understand. But obviously what you're doing is a very, very heroic um, act, uh, along with many other investigative uh, journalists. There are young ones in the public, but even older ones must be fearing for their lives. So I'd like to ask you, how do you protect yourself, your group, your team, your data, your sources? Is that something we can talk about? I mean, Obviously, a lot of young investigative and independent reporters who do not have the backing of institutions, let alone, let's say, individuals who may be, be able to provide security, must be wondering you know, how to get into a field that is very, very threatening to one's person. Thank you. Um. Well, first of all, I think the, the heroic acts are done by much more uh, by the Russian journalists in this case, or the Belarusian journalists, uh, who did it where they could be held criminally liable under their crazy laws of treason, high treason, where they were, uh, could be arrested, kidnapped, and tortured uh, in Moscow or in uh, Kazan or wherever. We are much more immune to that or were, at least, until the war started. Because there was, a, there was this 
understanding that uh, the Russian security apparatus is going after traitors. That was kind of the one thing that, in their view, view, permits them to go and kill. And very rarely they would do that. They cannot treat foreigners as traitors. Yeah? So that, that was the one protecting um, measure. Um, but now, with the war, what we discussed with Desi is that the Russian government has completely lost any uh, structure of who they want to hurt. They've lost any concept of, of reputation cost. And this, this is changing the equilibrium. So it is, it is riskier now for, for us and for other non-Russian journalists. Mm, we take all the predict obvious measures you can take, but when you work in several countries at the same time, and this week I've been in, in, uh, in six countries, uh, there's no way that you can have protection everywhere. You can have protection in your home base, uh, as I do here, but I mean, I was, I, I just came from, uh, from Spain there, and, and obviously, and, 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 and sp like Barcelona is the place that is full of Russian spies, so th there's nothing, nothing you can do uh, to protect yourself there. So um, there's no easy uh, recipe, you just have to take that into account. You have to be as unpredictable as possible. Um, you have to protect your data because your data is also a uh, sort of uh, shortcut into your location, into your way of life. The one thing to keep in mind is that government assassins, they like predictability. They really get lost when they don't know about their target schedule. They need to follow you for days or months to establish a pattern. So you, they can get that from either via observation or by hacking you. And if you are protecting yourself in terms of being unpredictable or you don't allow to be hacked, then you're somewhat protected. But there's no, no, no easy answer to this. And that's why I wouldn't say that every journalism working as a freelancer, as a blogger, should jump into investigating the GRU. In fact, when I started investigating the GRU myself in 2015-16, when I was still not formally part of Bellingcat, my wife said, uh, wisely, you have to join an organization because for them the reputation risk of killing somebody who, who is in an organization is much higher. So I think that's, that's a first uh, step that, uh, that a young investigator should take. But I don't have the final answer to that. Mm -hmm. I want to take the ra last round of questions. I see one here. Mirena, you said? Oh, no. Yeah, and if there are others, please raise your hands now so that I want to collect them at once, and then Christo will have the last word. And Hi. Um, I was more interested to learn about the technology that Bellingcat uses to obtain its information. You mentioned some scraping methodology, um, and I'd love to hear more about um, you know, you've got volunteers and in investigative journalists working for your organization, but I'm sure you need a lot of IT developers' resources, including AI specialists, to be able to, you know, do a proper analysis of the data. And also, I'd like to um, ask a little bit about um, how does your organization get financed? And uh, let's collect the other question, then you have the Thank final you word. for letting me ask the second question. Are you investigating these sudden deaths of people who are around Putin? Yes. Um, I will, I, I, okay, so, uh, Bernard, I think you're here, but two days ago I was speaking in uh, Zurich, and I said that since the beginning of the week I've had already 40 meetings, and there's not been a single meeting where the last question is not about the deaths around Putin. So it exactly follows the pattern, yes? <laughs> Um, and I'll get to that in a second. First, uh, shall we wait for another question or shall we start? I think there is, a same, there okay. is one more, right? Yes, I have one more question. It's more about the past in Russia because you mentioned like a social contract and I wonder what is the difference between Ukraine now and the war, like the second Chechnya war? Why did the social contract hold back then and why doesn't it now? Because, I mean, maybe it's because Putin was a new political figure. I don't know what you are thinking about it. Mm -hmm. mm, okay, so um, started with technology and scraping. Um, you would be 
misled to think that it's all AI and it's all uh, very high tech because a lot of the work is still uh, manual. Uh, the scraping of visual data for uh, the war conflicts comes on a heuristic uh, algorithm where we essentially look, initially entered manually some of the most prolific uh, observers and, and, and kind of tweeters and, uh, of, of, of videos from, from the war. And then we started actually using them as seeds. We started following who else uh, they are retweeting or reposting, and we expanded this universe to original posters. So we looked for as many as possible original posters, and they're essentially, uh, we created a Telegram bot that aggregates all of these original posters. Um, we automatically deduplicate the videos or the, or the photographs, and then the, re the remainder is the net new material for the day, and it's manually inserted by, by the team of 15. So it's, it's a bit manual and it's a bit boring, but, uh, but it works, so it doesn't have to be AI only. Um, the financing, we are about 30% of our annual budget comes from our own training fees uh, that we charge when we train journalists. Uh, we used to train policemen as well, but we, we decided not to do that anymore because they're also bad policemen, believe it or not. Um, but, but training, 30%, 70% is donations. So the donations, about 40% uh, are really small donations from individuals, including a lady from Texas who's sending us $20 bills every, uh, every two weeks. <laughs> yes, it's Proposed? so sweet. Uh, and and an, an old woman, uh, literally last week, we received uh, a call from an uh, executioner, but in the good sense, a, a lawyer who is executing a will in the Netherlands who said uh, an old lady just died and we opened her will and you got it. Bellingcat got the house. <laughs> so now we have a house in a village. Um, so yeah, and, and the other, and 60% are, are more corporate funders like the uh, Erste Foundation was helping as well and the uh, open source fund, but we don't take government money. That's the only, diff the only restriction, uh, n even when it's via a foundation. For example, uh, we used to take money from the National Endowment for Democracy, which is partly funded by Congress, and we, s we stopped that from last year. So yeah, everything except government money we're, we're taking. Um, and a new rule that we just introduced is when we take corporate money now, corporate donations, we assign a team to find out if we can do an investigation on that company and publish it. So think before you offer to fund us, uh, because we'll look at you as a priority. Okay, the, the question on uh, the f people falling out of windows, I assume, is the... Um, first of all, you have to understand that more Russians are falling out of windows by definition, it just happens so, yeah? Uh, <laughs> so don't always look for a, for a vicious explanation. And, and also, in the nine cases that you're referring to, there were at least several that had a plausible explanation because the person was in a depression, one person was, uh, had cancer, the other one had really threatened to do something. But there are, there are at least four that are not easily explained um, by anything. They don't see to be connected to any opposition to the war. They don't see to be connected to... The one connecting thing is a connection to oil and gas businesses. And I have one theory, but it's not proven. So it's, it's basically money related. It's related to reallocation of large amounts of money that were funneled through oil and gas businesses. and. At a time of war, when there's chaos, when there's, there's no certainty what will happen after the war, there's always an increase in attempts to reallocate money. So that's the one commonality in the cases, but I don't have the, the final answer to that yet either. Uh, and uh, the last question was, sorry. I think this was it. Yes, uh, yeah, Chechnya, yes. Very good question. Now. Uh, there are differences and there are, there are significant, uh, there, are, there are similarities but significant differences. Um, first of all, I mean, Russian society uh, in general was seeing Chechnya as, uh, 
we're seeing the Chechens as others, yeah, very others. Um, so using a pretext for creating the image of a stable new leader, um, sort of the threat from a secessionist, separatist uh, government or uh, 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 group of people who want to cut away a piece of your territory, was a sufficient unifying force at the time, uh, especially if if it was paired with the threat of terrorism, which, of which there was, there was some real and some imaginary as well. Um, but a key difference between then and now is that the Russian population had not yet gotten accustomed to the uh, lifestyle of comfortability that 20 years um, gave them, um, which is completely different now. So the expectations for stability, economic and otherwise, now is much, much different than it was in 1999, 2000. And uh, mm, uh, I give this example. We've been tracing the most frequently asked questions on, on the Russian version of Google, on Yandex, um, which is a very good window into the soul of the Russian collective mind. And for the first four months of the war, the most frequently asked question, okay, always in the top five was, when are we, got, when are we going to get IKEA back, yeah? So this tells you how much Russia has become a consumer society where despite all of the um, attempts by philosophers and, and, uh, and the like to tell them that they are part of something different than the rest of the world, that they have some exclusive non-individualist streak that um, is in inherent? No. Um, so that's the difference now, I think. Um, it was really a consumerist deal that was given to them, and, and now the deal is broken. Please join me in thanking Christo Grosse for this conversation.